to the inquisitorial representative. Report concerning the history of the Drakari slash Dark Eldar. My lord, as per your instructions, I have compiled a brief history of this decadent and vile race. I believe it is odd that we are now referring to them using their own tongue. A similar situation exists for the Eldari, or as we once officially called them, the Craftworld Eldar. I and many other members of our glorious organization are concerned by the turn of events requiring this change of language, which appears to have originated from our most glorious and rightful regent, the Primarch Rebute Gilliman. I believe these concerns may have some merit considering the nature of the Imperial Regent's resurrection. But that is an issue for another time. This report covers the origins of the Dark Elder, some information concerning their history and development, as well as their culture and behaviour, which I believe should prove enlightening to any considering the nature of our relationship moving forward. The Dark Eldar epitomise everything that is wanton and cruel about the ancient race from which they descend. Fiercely intelligent and devious to a fault, these piratical raiders revel in pain, for feeding upon the suffering of others is the only way they can stave off the slow death of their own selves. The Dark Eldar see themselves as the true inheritors of the ancient Eldar Empire, and look upon everyone else as either cowards or dim-witted prey. The boundless and brilliant potential of their kind is put to every terrible purpose they can imagine, and because their lives span millennia, the Dark Eldar have all the time in the world to perfect their Stygian arts. The warrior castes of the Dark Eldar are tall and live without exception. Their alabaster skin is almost corpse-like in its pallor, for there is no true sunlight within their shadowy realm. Their athletic physiques are lined with whipcord muscle, honed and enhanced until they are superior even to those of their Craftworld Eldar cousins, for the Dark Eldar prize martial prowess most highly. They stride through the fires of battle with the surety and poise of demigods, but their magnificence is only skin deep. Viewed with the witch sight, the Dark Eldar are repugnant monsters, eternally thirsting for the anguish of others in order to fill the aching void at their core. The Dark Eldar quickly learn to fight with every weapon at their disposal in order to survive. Little distraction is drawn between the sexes, for an individual's skill and cunning is far more important than physical traits such as height or gender. Their senses are keen to the point of paranoia, their shadowed eyes and tapered ears alert to the slightest disturbance. In the dark city in which they make their lair, the incautious do not survive for long. While countless generations of physical conflict have ensured the Dark Eldar have better reaction speed and greater physical strength than other elements of the Eldar race, the innate psychic abilities of their forebears have atrophied. For such psychic pyrotechnics could draw the gaze of she who thirsts, the nemesis of the Eldar race. As such, the use of psychic powers is one of the few things forbidden within the Dark City. Though it is manufactured instead of physically grown, the weaponry of the Dark Eldar is just as advanced as that used upon the craft worlds. In matters of war, the Dark Eldar are artisan supreme. Their technology refined to such a point that it may as well be magical. Their endless imagination and skill has led them down a sinister path indeed. Their favourite tools of war include splinter weapons that can set every nerve aflame with pain, dark light beams, whips that bleed acidic ichor, and eldritch soul traps. The Dark Eldar are so confident in their abilities that their lightweight bodysuits incorporate bladed plates, not only for protection, but also to give them yet another weapon to use upon their prey. Collectively, the warriors of Kimura know all the ways there are to kill the other denizens of the galaxy, and delight in perfecting as many as they can. They turn their backs upon the material dimension long ago, but when the Dark Eldar emerge from their twilight realm, they revel in the ability to outclass their enemies. 
They rarely sully their tongues with the grunting languages of the lesser races, using translator technology on the occasion that communication is unavoidable. The warrior cabal strikes swiftly and without warning from portals opened within the labyrinthine dimension of the webway, only to disappear like ghosts when enemy resistance becomes too severe. Their piratical raids attack from above, whole armies screaming into the midst of the foe upon Baroque gravcraft before leaping down to experience the slaughter firsthand. Sprays of arterial blood and spasming corpses mark their passage. The laughter of these merciless warriors, the last thing their victims ever hear. To these cursed individuals, the sweet fruit of horror is as pleasing as the caress of a razored blade across soft flesh. They relish breaking the bodies of their captives, but prize even more highly the process of crushing the spirit, for nothing is more gratifying to a dark Eldar than securing utter dominion over one who has resisted them. They drink in every nuance of woe, until their captives gibber and plead for death, a mercy of the dark Eldar are famously slow to grant. Before we delve into the history proper, I feel it is important to explain three areas separately, so that the reader may fully understand the rest of this history. Gods. As far as the Dark Eldar are concerned, the Eldar gods died in the fall, and they despise them for it. That the gods had become so weak that they could be consumed by the ascendancy of the Eldar's collective depravity is a sign that they did not deserve to exist in the first place. The exceptions are Cain, who is still held in high regard in Camorra, and the lesser powers known as the Dark Muses, they who epitomize carnal and selfish vice, and whose clandestine worship contributed to the demise of the original Eldar gods. The Satellite Realms if a traveller were somehow to breach Camorra's runic wards, he would first bear witness to its tributary realms, shimmering and distorting around it. One minute these vassal domains would glimmer in the distance, the next they would loom so close that their palaces and minarets could be seen by the naked eye. To venture unheralded past these satellite realms is to invite destruction. These are the hidden domains in which the Dark Eldar enact their vile rites and devilish schemes. Their origins lie in the tumultuous times that preceded the fall, as the cults of excess began to thrive. Their private realms in the webway flourished unseen until the largest of their number grew powerful enough to threaten Kimura itself. Over the course of its millennia-long history, Camorra has subsumed all of the vassal domains it has not destroyed, linking one palatial sub-realm to another with ancient portals and gates. Within the gilded corridors and flesh pits of the myriad sub-realms frolic those Eldar who engineered the fall of their own race, laughing still at the warnings of their sombre craftworld cousins. Real Space Raids The strike forces of the Dark Eldar, despite consisting of treacherous and scheming murderers, work like well-tuned machines upon the battlefield. Raids are planned in meticulous detail by the Archons and Succubi that lead them, and hidden routes through the webway are opened in readiness for the assault. Only the most capable are recruited for each Real Space Raid, for to fail in an invasion's execution is to bring an entire cabal that much closer to its downfall. This is why Dark Eldar warriors are such determined opponents, and why there is such a rivalry amongst them. Working in concert ensures that not only the greatest amount of punishment is inflicted upon real space, but also that the maximum number of victims can be taken back to Kimura. Vendettas are revisited only once the captives are divided, for above all, the Dark City requires a steady intake of fresh souls. The Cabars regularly launch piratical invasions, so that there is much to be gained from being part of such an organisation. The thrill of hunting lesser mortals, the chance to personally capture new slaves, 
but most importantly, the revitalizing feast of unbridled destruction at Hunt's End. Upon the Cabal's return to Kamora, thousands of captives will be traded as currency, put to work in the hellish depths of the weapon shops, rendered down in flesh troughs, or tormented unto death. Their demise drawn out as long as possible, so that their captors can gain even more sustenance from their misery. The Jakari are fundamentally a piratical slave trading race, and only conduct military operations in pursuit of profit of one kind or another. The raid upon the planet of Grey Shroud shed been lightning. It was conducted in 944M41 by the Cabal of the Poison Tongue on the hive world of Grey Shroud. Throughout the battle, the Cabalite forces displayed effortless superiority over the Imperial defenders, making the humans appear clumsy and foolish as they reeled from one crippling blow after another. Yet the breathtaking precision and efficiency of the Grey Shard raid was the product of many months' meticulous planning by one of the Dark City's greatest minds, Lady Aurelia Malice herself. Over a period of a single day, Lady Malice and her allies enacted a complex plan of attack that crippled the planet's infrastructure, confounded its defenders, and allowed the Dark Eldar to successfully make off with millions of captive souls. This day of woe began thus. Hour 1. Outsystem augury platforms are silenced with pinpoint LAS fire from Cabalite spacecraft. Their destruction timed to coincide with solar flare activity from Grey Shroud Star. Their loss goes undetected and unremarked, yet it leaves the hive world deaf and blind. Hour 4. The orbital defense platform Angel Defiant goes ominously silent. Scourges slip undetected from the webway, deploying haywire weaponry to knock out the platform's primary genitorium. Plunged into freezing darkness, their oxygen venting rapidly, the garrison have no way to call for help as mandrakes crawl from the shadows and begin the hunt. Hour 7. Some days previous, the Imperial Navy warship Hammer of Pride was stationed in orbit above Grey Shroud in response to localised pirate activity. After routine Vox hails to Angel Defiant go unanswered, a request is made to the Hammer's captain to investigate. Privately, cursing the ineptitude of the Planetary Defence Force, the captain acquiesces, and the Hammer makes to rendezvous with the platform. It never reaches its destination. Hour 8... Hammer of Pride comes under sudden and furious attack. Swarms of razor-winged jet fighters and void raven bombers appear as if from nowhere, harassing the ship mercilessly and crippling key shields and weapons. Swamped by targets, the Hammer's turrets fail to intercept a salvo of barbed warheads that arc down to strike the warship's bridge. Though they cause only minor damage, the missiles discharge a tailored, puppet plague into the air of the bridge. Moments later, the crew lose control of their own bodies as the neural infection compels them to place the Hammer of Pride onto a new heading. Its crew, shrieking with helpless, horrified laughter, the Hammer is seized by Greyshard's gravatic field and drawn onto a collision course. Following a perfectly calculated trajectory, the warship plunges through the atmosphere and crashes into the barracks fortress of the 4th Grey Shroud PDF, engulfing the complex in a storm of plasma and killing hundreds of thousands. Hour 9. Under cover of severe atmospheric disruption caused by the impact of Hammer of Pride, a sizable force of raiders, ravagers and venoms emerges from the webway above the continent of Morlos. With the 4th PDF annihilated, few stand ready to oppose the invaders. An elite force of Incubi, Cabali Trueborn and Scourges break open the defences of Morlos's genitorium primus, gleefully butchering all resistance. Moving with slick efficiency, the Dark Eldar rig the plasma generators with hyper-dense containment fields. For over an hour, the generators run at ever greater outputs, unable to vent or discharge until their own enhanced efficiency causes them to detonate. A vast power surge 
roars out through the underground ducts and cabling, overloading systems across Morlos and beyond. As the void shields and defense batteries of Morlovia Hive experience sudden power loss, Lady Melisse's force, which has been waiting patiently in the lower atmosphere for a window of opportunity, descends. Gaping rents are blasted in the hive's iron hide, and swarms of piratical craft and whooping hellions pour inside. By the time the hive's backup generators begin to kick in, it is far too late. Hour 11 to 20. As word of the plight of Morlovia Hive spreads across Greyshout, PDF units scramble to mobilize. On the southern continent of Larnos, Imperial reinforcements are forced to reroute after dozens of outlying settlements come under attack. Wings of Valkyrie soar over the snowfields, but each time the defenders arrive too late. In several cases, Imperial forces are ambushed shortly after deployment, corralled and massacred by lightning-fast reavers and witches. On Solon, the 1st and 5th Grey Shroud PDF deploy en masse in response to reports of deformed horrors raiding agroponic settlements near Salarid Hive. Piling out of their chimeras and toroxes, the PDF find the agriplexes deserted, yet terror engulfs the soldiers when crop-misting servitors shudder into action, releasing clouds of atomized combat stims. Amid the banks of purple-tinged fog, the PDF troopers fall upon one another in a frenzy, tearing at each other until the walkways run red. On the northern continent of Gauma, a trio of 2nd Regiment drop craft clear the southern coast, their passengers unaware that they are carrying monstrous stowaways. Crushed into the hollow spaces within each craft's superstructure, Grotesques lie dormant, as the timers on their spinal stumps run slowly down to zero. One after another, the lurking horrors are activated, stimulants flooding their bodies until they tear their way into the troop bays with deafening roars. The interior of each lander becomes an abattoir, as the grotesques vent their fury upon passengers and crew alike. One by one, the craft plunge into the icy waters of the ocean, to disappear without trace. Hour 21. Bereft of reinforcements, cut off in the dark, the citizens of Morlovia Hive are harvested in their millions. Localised Arbites forces manage only a token resistance, while the nobles of the Hive Spa lock themselves away behind gold-chased bulkheads and abandon their people to their fate. This does not save them. By the time the battered forces of the Grey Shroud PDF finally reach the crippled Hive City, millions of citizens have been spirited away by Lady Melisse's forces, never to be seen again. I believe this provides a prime example of the methods of war utilised by the Dark Eldar. Successful Cabalite raids see the Dark Eldar return to Kamora with rich crops of slaves, Many of these unfortunates are human, for the Imperium's planets are often densely populated and thinly defended. However, this is far from universally true. When Archon Vresic led the flayed skull to Balgrog's world, he sought an entirely different sort of prey. The raid on Balgrog's world. For the Dark Eldar, life is a whirlwind of violent impermanence. They face a constant battle against spiritual starvation, their every thought and action bent towards staving off a gradual, withering degeneration. There is therefore an undeniable appeal to the most powerful amongst them in raising monuments to themselves. After all, barring another Archon tearing it down, a suitably gigantic and armor-clad effigy will never wither, falter, or fade. It was for this reason that Archon Vrasque Maladrict decided to celebrate his glories by building a giant statue of himself atop his cabal stronghold. Archon Vrasque faced an unusual difficulty, however. His cabal makes their lair amid an elaborate tangle of vents and pipes known as the Poisoned Crown. The foul fumes billowing from these twisted chimneys come all the way up from the coven layers of the Underscore and are so toxic that no human work gang can long survive them. Vrasque realised that if he wanted his towering monument completed, he would require a hardier breed of slave. The Archon gathered a raiding party, 
complementing his cabal's aerial strength with a rogue's gallery of mercenaries and horrors, and prepared to acquire slaves equal to the task at hand. The planet the Archon's party chose for their raid was once an imperial hive world with a population of trillions. Decades ago, a violent climate shift had left the world ravaged by billowing toxic storms. Its human populace had withered, the final blow coming when the orcs of Wag Bulgog attacked. The greenskins tore the hives down around their inhabitants' ears, slaughtering the weakened defenders to the last. Now, the planet belonged to the Greenskins alone, themselves reduced to a fraction of their former strength by the hostile climate, yet those orcs who survived had become all but immune to the poisonous atmosphere in which they lived. Their apparent good fortune, ironically, marked them out as the perfect slaves to fulfil the Archon's vision. Balgrog, being a wily and grizzled old scarboy, had built his fortified lair in the ruins of Hive Cadestine, the greatest of the imperial cities of old. In the hands of the orcs, the hive had become a great teetering fortress of trembled wreckage, studded with ramshackle gun emplacements and jagged battlements. A string of huge arced bridges linked the fastness to the rubble-strewn shanty towns that were all that remained of the outer hive. Each cluster of Lean toss, still teeming with orcs, yet far less defensible than the heart of the old hive. It was upon a stretch of the anarchic outhive, therefore, that the Archon's blow fell. When the cabal of the flayed skulls struck, they did so hard and fast. Bladed warriors in crimson and bone rode their raiders out of the leprous clouds of a toxic storm. Many orcs had hunkered down behind barricades and heaps of scrap, hoping to weather the gale force winds. Now they looked up in surprise as dark, barbed shapes shot low through the murk, spitting volleys of fire into their midst. Amid drumming gunshots and wind-torn explosions, dozens of cabalites disembarked from their craft and began to encircle their shocked prey. The winds and toxic clouds were no impediment to the Dark Eldar, whose elaborate rebreathers and gyro-stabilised armour compensated for the effects of both. Not so the orcs, who were forced to lean into the gale, squinting through blast goggles and fizzling fog scopes as they sought their attackers. Dashing forward through the ruins with their blades bared, the Dark Eldar set about themselves with whoops of glee. The orcs fought back ferociously, lunging through the toxic clouds to hack apart camerites and sprays of blood. Yet the greenskins were at a terrible disadvantage, their belligerence and ferocity no match for the cabalites' carefully executed ambush. Streams of crystalline splinters cut the orcs to pieces, or hurled them convulsing to the ground. Incubi stalked from one fight to the next, blades glinting blood wet. In the half-light, as they sliced off heads, arms and legs with graceful flourishes of their claves. For every greenskin butchered, many more were paralysed or rendered insensible by carefully tailored venoms, snared in crackling electronets, or hauled aboard waiting raiders like some bizarre fisherman's catch. Cabalites sprinted across tangled streets and flitted through blasted ruins, laying low each surprised band of orcs as they encountered them. Matters might have continued in this one-sided fashion, had not the storm suddenly abated, stripping away the raiding party's cover. Becoming aware of the battle raging on their city's outskirts, hundreds more greenskins began to flock towards what sounded to them like a pretty good fight. Ramshackle bikes and buggies roared down the scrap-strewn streets. Mobs of orcs scrambled through the ruins, lugging cumbersome heavy weapons while columns of ramshackle tanks crashed through walls and rubble. Meanwhile, in the heart of the city, larger engines bellowed into life. The Archon had planned his raid carefully, however. He knew that should his forces be surrounded, they would be swiftly buried by the overwhelming numbers of the foe. Thus, as the greenskins surged through the city towards the raiding party, dark specks plunged from the skies above. Screaming low over the orc hordes, razor-wing jet fighters and void-raven bombers struck at key targets amidst the enemy advance. The craft dived from on high, engines screaming like the damned as they strafed the orc weapon batteries. flacker dacker guns chugged as they pumped streams of shots into the air and swatted several Dark Eldar craft from the skies. 
Yet the orcs had the worst of it, their batteries detonating one by one as dark beams of energy and shatterfield missiles punched through their armour to smash them to ruin. Void Raven bombers streaked over the rusted arterial bridgeways, void mines gouging great glowing craters out of the orc warbands charging across them. One by one, the old, rusted roadway shuddered and gave way, collapsing amid the screams of tortured metal and plunging hundreds of orcs to their deaths. Scourges swooped above the advancing greenskins, diving through an ill-aimed storm of fire to strafe their foes again and again. The winged mercenaries struck, retreated and struck again, gradually luring the aggressive enemies away from the Archon and his warriors. Casualties amongst these diversionary forces were high, yet their efforts pulled ever more greenskins away from the real fight. As the orcs spread thin, mandrakes flickered through the shadows, snatching stragglers into the darkness. Panic spread in their wake, orcs firing blind into darkened alleys or clustered back to back, unaware that their tormentors had already moved on. Gradually, the onrushing greenskin advance stalled amid chaos and confusion. Finally, through the madness came Bulgrog himself, riding aboard his towering stomper, Bad Dasher. Spotting the huge war engine lurching through the city ruins gave even the Archon pause, yet the sight of the grandiose boss pole that jutted from its shoulder told him the Orc leader had joined the fight at last. The Archon had no use for the war boss as a captive, but his death, writ large across the battlefield, where none could miss it, would surely throw the orcs into confusion. The Archon ordered an immediate withdrawal, hacking a path through the mass in greenskins to leap back aboard his raider. Some of the cabalites were cut off, overrun by the foe or blasted apart by sizzling energy weapons, yet the remainder followed their Archon's lead, their attack craft arrowing up away from the green horde and making for the stomper. Closing fast on the massive foe, the Dark Eldar craft hurtled, around the towering war machine, tearing at it like a furious flock of shrikes. The stomper's guns blazed and roared, filling the sky with a hurricane of fire that sent razor wings and raiders tumbling end over end to explode amid the ruins below. At the same time, however, the Dark Eldar guns were cutting the war engine apart. Dark beams of energy stabbed into the Behemoth's hull, boring through armor plates and steam pipes. Explosions tore through the stompers' decks as stockpiles of ammo detonated in a thunderous chain. Raging fires filled the engine from top to toe, flaming grots leaping screaming to their death from open hatches. Still, the stompers' guns roared, the orcs on board refusing to accept that Bad Dasher could possibly be destroyed. But finally, even as Bulgrog dashed from the escape hatch, the stomper went up with a thunderous boom, the shockwave of its explosion hurling Dark Eldar and Orcs alike from their feet. With their war boss blown to bits, along with his biggest and best weapon, the Greenskins, as is their way, lost all cohesion. The Dark Eldar stalked the city for several hours more, preying on isolated knots of the foe. Finally, weighed down with slaves, the Cabalites swept skywards once more, the Archon's raid had been a great success, though barely half the raiding party returned to Kamora alive, they did so in victory. And of course, the Archon statue would be completed at last, built upon the broken backs of the orcs of Bolgrog's world. I hope that these examples of the Dark Eldar's activities will aid you in appreciating the history that follows. Ancient History the Dark Eldar have fallen from grace, in the most profound of ways. Trace their lineage back far enough and their roots can be found at the height of the ancient Eldar society, when there was a highly advanced and sophisticated race that ruled the stars. And the various descendant cultures that exist to our current age are but pale reflections of their glory. The ancient Eldar had perfected their science to such an extent that they could reforge planets to their liking and quench stars at a whim. Hard work became a distant memory. The Eldar, proud in their belief that they had already mastered their own destiny, spent more and more time in esoteric pursuits in order to escape the ennui that set in over the course of their centuries-long lives. 
The Eldar psyche is a thing of duality and intense complexity. It can experience zeniths of bliss and nadirs of horror far more keenly than that of other races. It is just as capable of falling into corruption as it is of transcending to the sublime. With so much power at their beck and call, the core of the Eldar Empire, once a masterpiece of civilization, became centered around the pursuit of individual fulfillment. Amongst the pleasure seekers and the interminably curious were those whose pursuits of excess became ever more extreme. These included a great proportion of the aristocracy of ancient Eldar society, those with the wealth and the time to truly explore the fruits of decadence. One by one, the leaders of the cults of excess that were taking over Eldar society became obsessed with their own power. They relocated their power bases into the labyrinthine dimension known as the Webway, for such was their influence that they could command entire sub-realms to be created in which to continue their debased works. Unseen, these dilettante lords grew in power and influence, initiating more and more of the ancient Eldar into their strange and shadowy creeds. The Eldar are psychically gifted above all other races, and as corruption gradually took hold upon them, echoes of ecstasy and agony began to ripple through time and space. In the parallel dimension of the warp, the reflections of these intense experiences began to coalesce, for the shifting tides of the Empyrean can take form around raw emotions, and attract more of such abstract energies to themselves. The constant stream of indulgence pouring from the Eldar Empire was unstoppable as the tide. It nourished and empowered that which lay within, a nascent god of excess, content for now to wait and to grow. The Fall of the Eldar As the Eldar Empire began to sink into the mire of its own corruption, brother turned against brother in pursuit of ever darker pleasures. There were, however, some who foresaw the disaster awaiting them and fled to safety. The first of these were the Exodites, those who saw their peril clearest of all, and instead chose to establish a network of colonies far away from the blighted heart of the Empire. Many of them exist there still, their cultures living in a symbiotic relationship with the world spirits of the planets they protect. Amongst the last to escape were the forefathers of the craft world, Eldar. As their society devolved into madness, they looked upon their works and recoiled in horror from what they had become. Realising that they stood upon the brink, they bent their considerable resources to the construction of immense craft worlds, graceful space cities the size of small moons. The Eldar of the craft worlds retreated into asceticism and introspection, preserving what they could of their ancient culture. They left the heartlands of the Eldar Empire for the dubious safety of the void, to the jeering contempt of those who remain behind. Some even managed to flee far enough to escape the devastation that was to follow. As depravity riddled every aspect of their society, the cults of excess sought ever more violent thrills. Before long, the streets of the Eldar cities ran with blood. The elegant architecture of their palaces became battlegrounds as the Eldar preyed upon each other, reveling in the cruelest of crimes. Their insanity and tainted passion poured into the warp until it achieved critical mass. With an apocalyptic bellow that tore the heart out of the Empire, a new god was born, Slanesh, the Dark Prince of Excess. Slanesh's birth screams were so powerful that they destroyed countless billions of souls in a psychic shockwave that coursed throughout the galaxy. In an instant, most of the Eldar race was destroyed, consumed by a cataclysm of terror and pain. The epicentre of their empire was sucked into the warp, leaving a yearning void of pure chaos in its place. Slanesh gorged upon their despair. Unstoppable in its ascendancy, the new god consumed the ancient deities of the old Eldar Empire and scattered their remains to the corners of the warp. The Eldar civilization was gone. All that was left were the exodites of the furthest flung maiden worlds, the craft worlders who had travelled far enough to escape the shockwave of destruction caused by Slanesh's birth, 
and those hidden in the sub-realms of the Webway. Much of the Webway was shattered into ruin, but unlike the Craftworld Eldar who fled the catastrophe in real space, those Eldar who had built their own jealously guarded empires in the Webway remained physically unaffected by Slanesh's birth. The echoes of the new gods' apotheosis still resounded within them, but unlike their kin in real space, they had escaped destruction. In their supreme arrogance, they did not cease their quest for excess, even for a moment. Repentance and atonement were outmoded concepts to a people who acknowledge no limit to their power. The change that was wrought upon those Eldar sealed within the webway was far more subtle. Rather than having their essence consumed in one great drought, their souls were slowly drained away into the warp, consumed over time by Slanesh, the entity the Eldar call She Who Thirsts. The Eldar hate and fear Slanesh above all, for she was given life by their actions, and yet she waits hungrily upon the other side of the veil to claim each and every one of them. Whereas the Eldar of the Craftworld learned to deny Slanesh's hold upon them using mystical spirit stones and infinity circuits, the Eldar of the Webway became exceptionally good at ensuring that lesser beings suffer in their stead. Provided they steeped themselves in the most evil and decadent acts, the Eldar of the Webway found that the curse of Slanesh could be abated. The agony of others nourished their withered souls and kept them vital and strong, filling their frames with unnatural energies. Assuming they could feed regularly enough, the Eldar of the Webway became physically immune to the passage of time. So it was that the Dark Eldar were born, a race of sadistic murderers who feed upon the anguish of others in order to prevent the slow deaths of their immortal souls. Ten thousand years later, Slanesh's thirst pulls at them still. There truly is no escape. The Dark Eldar race has unwittingly exchanged a horrible but mercifully quick death for an eternity of hunger. To this day, the Dark Eldar raid and pillage the galaxy at large from their hidden sub-realms in the webway, sowing as much misery and destruction as possible, and spiriting away millions of captives to their lairs for their own horrible ends. They are experts in techniques of torture and degradation. For the longer a Dark Eldar can drag out the punishment of a captive, the more nourishment he can derive from it. The Dark Eldar who has recently fed upon the torment of others, shines with a cold and startling aura of power, his form restored to perfection, even as his soul festers within. One who is starved of such energies for long enough will become a shadow of his former grandeur, desperately hunting for a taste of pain with which to stave off the gnawing in the depths of his soul. The Dark City Kimura's origins date back to the zenith of the Eldar, thousands of years before humanity even suspected its existence. It does not exist in real space, but in the Webway, a realm that rives with hidden life. The Webway The Webway, sometimes called the Labyrinth Dimension, is not a true dimension at all. It has been described as an incredibly complex network of arteries and capillaries, a maze of glowing tunnels, and a mystic tapestry of hidden threads that spread across the veil between real space and the warp. These analogues are crude at best, for the webway is a construct that spans the dimensions. It is defined by the fact that it sits between the material realm and the roiling tides of the warp, an intercist comparable to the surface of a mirror or the fabric of a veil cast over something foul. The ancient Eldar discovered that it was possible to exist within that silvered surface, to move within the threads of that veil, it was they who mastered the original Webway network, though it has changed drastically since the height of the Eldar Empire, torn open by war and disaster. Moving between the dimensions is a technique fraught with danger, but such is the skill and intellect of the Eldar that they still use it without hesitation. The Webway was created by an ancient alien race called the Old Ones as a conduit that allowed its masters to travel at will to countless far-flung worlds without risking the fickle tides of the warp. Since the fall, the Webway has become a realm shattered and dangerous, its splintered reaches infested by strange beings from different realities. 
Yet the webway's portals still allow the brave and the bold to strike without warning at millions of locations throughout real space. Kamura. In the depths of the webway lies Kamura, the lair of the Dark Eldar, called the Dark City by those who fear to speak its name. Kamura is no mere metropolis, for it is to the largest of imperial hives as a soaring mountain is to the Mound of Termites. Its dimensions would be considered impossible if they could be read by conventional means. If anything, Kamura is more like a vast collection of satellite realms and cities linked by uncounted portals and hidden pathways. Viewed from one perspective, Kamura is a loose collection of far-flung nodes spread throughout the arteries of the webway like a malevolent virus. Its clustered concentrations are, in reality, scattered across the galaxy, thousands of light-years apart in places, yet these locations are linked together by shimmering dimensional shortcuts. From within the webway's confines, the immense distances between each sub-realm can be crossed with a single step. Kamora appears within the webway as a composite entity of impossible scale, a shimmering, contradictory realm, the dimensions of which pluck at the sanity of those who approach it. Thousands of ships dock each day within its outflung spines, for the Dark Eldar are far more numerous than even their craft will kin suspect. Not only is it the society of the Dark Eldar that festers within, Kamora plays host to many diverse species of alien mercenaries, bounty hunters and renegades, all risking their souls in the hope of claiming the riches of the Dark City. The reaches of space around Kamora are stitched with scintillating light trails as vessels pass to and fro between the Dark City and the portals that surround it. Some of these gateways into real space are small and dim, but the arterial portals above the largest city-states blaze with ethereal light. Each can accommodate a pirate fleet with ease. To focus on the city that these portals serve is near impossible. Each distinct peak of spires and skyscrapers is larger than the last, each border below almost fractal in its complexity. A profusion of thorn dark spurs jut from every archipelago and tower, and ornate spacecraft held fast in crackling beams of electromagnetic force occupy every berth. The dark city seethes with a constant flow of corruption as it draws evil to itself, only to breathe it back out into the void. Kimura was originally the greatest of the webway port cities, able to transport a fleet to any one of the most vital planets of the Eldar Empire, because of the access it granted to the far-flung corners of real space, Kimura was reckoned to be the most important location in the entire webway. It was too valuable to the Eldar as a whole to belong to any single aspect of their empire, precisely because of its autonomy and the fact that it existed outside of the jurisdiction of the Eldar councils of that time. The city port quickly became a magnet for those wishing their deeds to be hidden from prying eyes. The realm of Kimura expanded unstoppably, as wealth and influence flowed across its borders. It spread outward into the void, consuming other webware port cities, private estates and sub-realms with each new expansion, growing ever larger and more impressive as it fed on plundered wealth. Kimura today is an endless nest of architectural contradictions and spatial anomalies, each of its estates has been overdeveloped to such an extent that their growth has been forced into the vertical plane, the rival regions sprouting upwards like a tangle of needle plants, fighting for a scrap of sunlight. Each of the spires and towers is linked to its fellows by hundreds of curved arches and strands, and crested with complex silver structures that glow with stolen energies. Its towering areas and palaces reach both upward and downward, spiralling into the depths of captive space. With every passing year, the parasitic city seeks to devour ever more of the hidden dimensions that act as its host. Stolen Suns Far above the glinting metallic pits of Kimura are the Ilmir, or Black Suns, Dying stars ablaze with poison light that were harnessed at the height of the Eldar Empire. Though held in sub-realms of their own, these celestial phenomena provide a near-endless supply of energy to the Dark City. Their twilight hues glint from the hulls of grab vehicles that swarm from spire to tower, from arena to battleground. 
Every now and then a thin solar flare curls from the captive sun out into Kimura, briefly illuminating the horrors below. Each such flare is reflected from a billion panes of crystal across the dark city, and yet it will be barely heeded by the teeming citizens, for they know that the sun's claws were blunted long ago. Though a few solar cults still exist in Kimura, most Dark Eldar view their tame stars with contempt. To them, they are but another resource to be mercilessly exploited. It is said that no starlight can shine upon the Dark Eldar without being harnessed, bled away, and eventually snuffed out altogether. The Desolation of Low Kimura Girding the titanic central spires of the Dark City are the trading districts of the Old Empire. Even the lowliest port was once an architectural masterpiece, but the ravages of civil war have not been kind. Lokomura is now a hodgepodge of shattered ruins and scavenged glories. Once proud, fortress complexes and barter ports spread out in all directions, and the black and angular spires of lesser cabals riddle the extremities with opportunistic growth. The outer zones are so congested that a traveller could wind through their labyrinthine depths for months on end without so much as a glimpse of a stolen sun. Many areas are haunted by scavengers and spectres, twisted beyond recognition by the tremendous upheavals of the fall. Their pitch-dark catacombs are prowled by far larger and uglier things than the Dark Eldar, for in Lo Kimura, the lost and the feral thrive. The outer districts of Lo Kimura are so many and varied that one cannot possibly visit them all in a single lifetime. Even to attempt to catalogue them would be fatal, for the Dark Eldar are highly territorial, and tend to kill intruders on sight, if only to pass the time. One such outer district is Hidden Blade, a crucially placed cabalite stronghold that sticks out like a jagged knife, thrust between the sloping shoulders of Port Carmine and Night Sound Gulen. Hidden Blade's asymmetric citadels bristle with disintegrator cannon, and each of its myriad Parapets and steeples is hung with vanquished foes in various states of dismemberment. Its hangar nodes are host to wings of razor-wing jet fighters and void raven bombers, their pilots itching for a chance to annihilate an unwelcome visitor. Port Carmine is second only in violent reputation to the Port of Lost Souls. The eye-wateringly tall spars of the starport sprout outward for miles, each host to a fleet of ornate spacecraft. The central docks of Port Carmine play host to the jaw-dropping spectacle of two major Kabbalite fleets at full anchor, the slashed eye cabal and the bloodthirsty stolen conscience, locked in a never-ending struggle for dominance. It is from Port Carmine that the renegade pirate Duke Sliscus stole the flagship Incessant Agony, a fact that drove its previous owner, Canite Arik Lex, to the edge of violent madness. He would later go on a adventure to Fenris. The war-torn ruins around Port Carmine are known as the Sprawls. Through their bleak streets wander the parched, cadaverous Dark Eldar who have fallen from grace and wound up on the periphery of society. These ravenous wretches seek to vicariously experience acts of extreme violence and rejuvenate their wasted bodies, drinking in the scraps of spectacle or reveling in the savagery of an airborne brawl between winged scourges and hellion skyboard gangs. Whenever a battle breaks out, the parched will cluster all about like freezing men to a flame. Just occasionally, they will drag their fatally wounded into the dark alleyways, fighting each other for scraps of the departing soul. The sprawls give way to a network of atriums and chambers through which flow the acid green river Kydis. This polluted waterway winds around and through the outer districts of central Coruscant, shrouded in subterranean darkness and wreathed in mist. Above its toxic surface drift thin gravcraft bedecked in faded grandeur, each host to a lost soul who earns what little he can by hooking corpses from the Kaides and selling them on as slave fodder. 
Jet bikes and sky chariots streak through the winding archways and ducks at dizzying velocity, slashing apart the corpse fishes below in merciless contests of speed. Further coolwood can be found in the mercenary district, Sek Meagra, more popularly known as Null City, a nation-sized shanty town permanently riven by civil war. A thick mist of cordite-scented pollution hangs over its roofs, and with every passing minute, fresh screams pierce the silence. At night, the scorched streets resound to solid-shot gunfire and the crackle-spit of splinter rifles as negotiations and assassinations turn sour. Occasionally, Xenos mercenaries can be found stalking Null Streets. It is rumoured that from time to time, the most vicious of their number are called upon to serve the cabals. Inward to Core As violent as they are, the districts of Locomora are but playgrounds in comparison to the inner rings that surround the Dark City's core. Here can be found the oldest noble houses. Their sweeping wings and mansions are crested by citadels full of proud aristocratic warriors, each of whom descends from the architects of the fall. Sorrowfell, the largest of the city-states, can trace its lineage to the ancient Eldar, girdles a promontory that leads into the region known as Corspur. Thirteen screaming statues of Supreme Overlord Astrobol Vect stand sentinel over Sorrowfell, each representing one of the foundations of vengeance. Their presence is a constant reminder that even the most powerful noble house was ultimately undone by raw intellect. One of the Dark City's ancient city-states has literally fallen into shadow. Islandrak, it is called, and it is one of several Camerite districts that exist in more than one dimension at once. In Islandrak, shadows thicken and writhe as living things, flowing into one another and crawling up the legs of those that trespass amongst them. Here, amongst the velvet domes, the dreaded mandrakes make their lairs, bathing in the darkness. Rumour has it that somewhere in that inky pitch is a portal to a world of shade demons that can freeze the soul with but a touch. The outskirts of Island Drac give way to bone middens of the witch cults, a district almost buried under mounds of calcified matter. Here can be found the remains of a representative of each sentient species in existence, positioned in grim tableaus and mock battles, Millions of skeletons, ranging in size from insects to towering colossi, strike unnatural and anguished poses throughout the middens, in a testament to the Dark Eldar's status as apex predators of the galaxy. Ranged beneath these inner districts are weapon and food factories, shocking in scale, spreading outwards and down into the lower spires underneath the old city. These factories ravenously consume millions of workers and slaves each year. Humans, orcs, Tau, and even Dark Eldar are amongst their number. For to a Dark Eldar, the cyclical monotony and sensory deprivation of the slave pits is a keener punishment than any pain. The slaves are watched over by divisions of cruel taskmasters, each of which is locked in a murderous rivalry with their peers. It is the world beneath the old city that allows Camorra to wage its ceaseless war against real space. For without a prodigious output of war material, the dark city would soon be forced to feed upon itself. The Towers of High Camorra The vast majority of the dark city's vertical mass is the province of the warrior elites. Impossibly high structures of polished stone, alloy, resin, flesh, and glass compete in their insane grandeur. Thousand-foot idols of cabalite archons and drachons stand incomplete amongst spiralling starscrapers that vanish beyond sight. Blood drips from the highest spires in squalls of red rain. Slaves crawl maggot-like across the fasces of titanic buildings, suspended in near-invisible webs as they labour to carve titanic likenesses of their cruel masters. Gargoyle-encrusted scimitar spines curve into the sky, and everywhere 
Barbed spires reach high towards the captive suns like stilettos, plunging into the heart of dark fire. Further towards the core, the central mass of towers, statues and spires forms a close-packed theatre for intercabalite war. Anti-grav transports hurtle past the jagged shrines and massive obsidian fortresses of the Incubi, where violent death awaits. Mercenaries and armoured bounty hunters, clad in segmented ghostplate, move stealthily under the vaulted arches, stalking those with a high price on their heads. Their most of high camaraderie is under the iron rule of the Cabalite masters that control them. There is a battleground that exists above the thickets of spires and graceful antennae. A world of scourge messengers and assassins, of terrifying aerial predators and the lightning-fast jet fighter pilots that hunt them for sport. Those who dwell in the areas of high camera consider themselves blessed and have little but contempt for those who fester in what they scornfully term Yeneldia, the necropolis below. Further down into the murk of Kimura one travels, the smaller the vessels that dart through its streets. The Middle Darkness, as it is known, is an area plagued by Hellions. These skyboard riding rebels careen through the foul air in great swarms that attack on sight. Though the Hellion gangs are feral and wild, they are not averse to allying with the Cabals when a real space raid is in the offing, and have even impressed the gladiators of the witch cults with their incredible displays of maneuverability and speed. The Arenas of the Witch Cults the witch cults fulfil a vital role within Camerite society. They stage displays of ultra-violence in the massive arenas built into their lofty citadels and razor-edged ziggurats, allowing the citizens of High Kimura to feed upon acts of murder and wanton killing refined to the level of an art form. Each arena is a multi-level structure of breathtaking complexity, its insides clustered with barbed stages upon which thousands of warriors and slaves meet a gory end. The arena's spectators observe from ornate thrones or from pleasure craft, drinking in the pain from a thrillingly unsafe distance. The arena plays host to some of the most elaborate displays of fighting skill in the universe, each witch is a paragon of physical perfection, and the sirens and succubi that rule over them are supernaturally adept at bestowing the gift of death. These champions enjoy a position of extreme prestige in Dark Eldar society, for the pain and terror they wring from their captives in the arena rejuvenates and sates all those who witness it. Most witch cults enjoy the patronage of one or more cabals. The cabals who are able to host the most impressive gladiatorial spectacles are generally secure in the safety of their throne. After a successful real space raid, it is common for the archons to make gifts to allied witch cults of vicious alien beasts, elite warriors of the lesser races, and those cabalites convicted of treason. They know that without the imaginative displays of killing put on in the witch arenas, Dark Eldar society would soon collapse in order to slack its eternal thirst for suffering. The practice of feeding the hot-blooded warrior populace of High Kimura with regular displays of bloodletting is known amongst the Archons as Lilithantu Clavar, the knife that stays the blade. The witch cults constantly strive to outdo each other in their performances, many of which spread into the audience in interesting and deadly ways as the excitement builds to fever pitch. Reaver jet bikes and hellions duel with impossibly agile warrior athletes that bound across bladed anti-grav platforms, spinning, slashing and twisting mere feet from the viewers so that arterial spurts of blood rain down into the rapt audience. The amphitheatres crackle with tension, every viewer leaning forward in his seat, with his eyes wide and a leer of a hungry predator etched upon his face. Once the final acts draw to a close, the Dark Eldar stride back to their lairs, looking younger and more vital than when they entered the arena. But the witch cults have far more to them than their main arenas. Below the elegant spirits and weapon nodes of each arena's 
exterior are academies and training complexes devoted to every aspect of the close quarter kill. Anti-gravity hemispheres and grueling living landscapes ensure each witch is at the peak of physical fitness. Each house keeps an extensive menagerie, restocked by its beastmasters with an endless supply of alien captives and dangerous species. Different witch cults practice their own specialities, endlessly discussed by the arena's crowd. The Bladed Hand, for instance, hone the art of the unarmed kill, though they are famous for blurring the line, whilst the Cult of Strife espouses a creed of sheer speed over strength. Around the peaks of the witch houses are the Toroid Arenas, elaborately curved racetrack complexes famous for their death races. The combatants that duel within are called Reavers, cliques of elite jet bike pilots whose reflexes are so sharp that they fight battles at breakneck speeds around the curvilinear interior of each arena. They hurtle past the ingenious traps and moving blades of each deathscape, careening into each other with their custom-bladed craft and mowing down those nearby with blasts from their sophisticated weaponry. A witch house will often stage real space raids purely at the behest of its succubus. These raids are not only to gather new fodder for the arena, but also a chance for the witches to match their skills against the finest warriors of the lesser races. A witch cult raid is considered high art by many Dark Eldar, who will pay handsomely to fight alongside the masked gladiators, alien beasts, and speeding aerial acrobats, that each succubus unleashes upon her prey. The Gorvin Fowl Raid One of the most infamous joint operations between the Cabal of the Black Heart and the Witch Cult of Strife was the raid upon the world of Gorvin Fowl. The planet was a stronghold of the Alpha Legion, a chaos space marine faction synonymous with the arts of stealth and subterfuge. For decades, an Alpha Legion warlord by the name of Jagathar Vrax had operated out of a fortress in Gorvenfall's Black Mountains. A noted bladesman, he plagued the surrounding systems with piratical raids, evading the Imperium's clumsy reprisals with ease. However, Vrax eventually overreached himself, having discovered that the Cabal of the Black Heart planned to raid the Imperial factory world of Maladrantis, he elected to use the Dark Eldar as pawns in his own schemes. Vrax concealed Alpha Legionaries on the planet's surface, ordering them to wait until the raid was well underway. At the battle's height, they struck, catching both the Cabalites and their beleaguered Cadian foes by surprise, and exacting a heavy toll upon them both. Vrax's forces escaped with a huge stockpile of weaponry and left the Black Heart to retreat empty-handed. Needless to say, such an insult could not be allowed to stand. Astrobal Vect spared no effort in tracking down this mysterious assailant and prepared an attack to make an example of him. This was not to be a slave raid, but a slaughter. It was at Vect's request that Lilith Hasperex herself join the forces arrayed for the attack, for to her would fall the task of personally humbling Jagrathar Vrax. The raid began as Gorvenfowl's bloated sun rose red and bloody on the horizon, as a swirling webway portal tore the skies above the Black Mountains. The Alpha Legionaries were caught completely by surprise. From the portal flew dozens of attack craft, falling like a rain of knives towards the squat immensity of the Alpha Legion stronghold, where it nestled amid the mountain peaks. By the time the Chaos air defences cycled up and flak batteries began to pound, it was already too late. Sleek fighter craft streaked overhead, bombs and missiles silencing one quad gun after another and tearing rents in the fortress's armoured hide. Through these poured the Cabalites of the Black Heart and the Witches of the Cult of Strife, leaping straight from the decks of their raiders into the smoke-shrouded corridors of the fort. Towering traitors strode to meet them with bolters blazing and blades bared. The Hecatari sprinted and leapt into the enemy's midst, cutting down the armoured giants with no fought for their own horrific casualties. Cabalite warriors advanced in the witch's wake, their firepower laying low those traitors who evaded the gladiatrix's blades. 
The surviving Alpha Legionaries were finally surrounded in their primary arming chamber, massively outnumbered and outgunned. It was here that Hesperex met Vrax in single combat, mockingly offering the Chaos Lord and his followers their freedom should he defeat her. A lethal swordsman with demonic strength burning in his veins, Vrax set upon his slender foe with his hellish forged broadsword. Hasperex met him with a simple knife in each hand, standing firm with a slight smile, quirking one corner of her perfect lips. The fight that followed was a storm of blades too fast for the eye to follow, and within moments Vrax's sword struck the floor, his severed hand still wrapped around its grip. Hasperex, bare flesh unmarred but for the Chaos Lord's blood, did not stop there, swiftly truncating his arms and legs to leave him roaring in helpless fury at her feet. Even as the Chaos Lord fell, his followers closed in once more. Only one Alpha Legionary left the fortress alive that day, and his limbless form still howls its endless agony upon the onyx gate of Astrobal's palace to this day. Dwellers Beneath The underside of Komora, if it could be termed as such, is host to almost as many edifices and spires as the top. They cluster together in anarchic profusion, many hollowed out by controlled acts of destruction until they form cavernous lairs. The underworld that lies underneath Komora is in an exceptionally dangerous place. It is the domain of the homunculi, a twisted brotherhood of torturers and monsters so ancient and steeped in evil that their continued existence requires daily acts of indescribable torment. The homunculi deal in body modification, drug distillation, and beauty elixirs, though the true source of their power lies elsewhere. Every member of the Kamerite society will wind up asking for their help at some point or another, for the homunculi are masters of the flesh, be it alive or dead. They are terrible of aspect, tall and slender in form, but surgically altered to an alien aesthetic that owes more to madness than beauty. Many homunculi believe themselves to be divine in nature, for to them death is but a minor inconvenience. Homunculi of a like mind gather together in covens, and each coven occupies a vast domain of cells and laboratories under the core. Here, these diabolical figures practice their vile experiments, melding the flesh of those that fall into their clutches and savouring pain as a gourmet would savour a fine meal. There is something of the alchemist in the homunculi's craft, but they prefer to consider themselves artists. To them, each foray into real space is not so much an act of war as an exhibition of their talents. It is said that homunculi are so ancient and jaded that they need to witness incredible amounts of pain each day or risk their soul withering away completely. Their pain is not something that's in short supply in the obliette of the homunculi. Most homunculi covens dwell at the bottom of spiral-edged pits underneath the core. Their narrow and twisting walkways are illuminated only by dim lamps sewn into the eye sockets of incautious visitors, for ranged along the walls are wretched figures fused into the superstructure. The eldest and most vile homunculi dwell at the heart of each spiralling labyrinth, revelling in the epic depravities of their own invention. To cross a homunculi, or even to obstruct his wreck servants as they go upon their grisly errands, is counted the most foolish of all sins in the Dark City. Though the consequences of such an act may take a long time to manifest, manifest they will, and when they do, they are likely to be horribly protracted and inventive. The Eternal Cycle The Eldar Gestation Cycle takes many laborious years to complete. As such, conventionally born children are rare symbols of status, usually granted their every indulgence and raised to be just as calculating and evil as their parents. Though procreation still occurs, Artificially grown Dark Eldar are far more commonplace. 
Once impregnated, a nascent egg can be removed from the womb and implanted in one of the amniotic tubes that honeycomb the breeding halls of the homunculi. Using a repulsive insectile science developed many millennia ago, the embryo's growth can be hyperaccelerated within these tubes, each new specimen drizzling unclean fluids before being taken away by wreck attendants. These half-born are seen with contempt by true-born Dark Eldar, who believe them inherently inferior. Yet the true triumph of the homunculi science is not the ability to create new life, but to deny death. Dark Eldar society thrives on treachery. Murder is rife, and each real space raid carries a high chance of mortality, for the lesser races of the galaxy are not without their defences. How, then, can Kamora endure against the omnipresent shadow of sudden death? Most Dark Eldar warriors, including each cabal's ruling elite, will at some point enter into a terrible pact with the homunculi that lurk beneath the core. The pact states that the homunculi will regenerate the warrior's body should he die, and in exchange the seeker will leave the homunculi a permanent portion of his soul. Even a corpse that has been all but destroyed in the crucible of war can be restored to its former glory. The master homunculi Urian Rakath once crafted a perfect new Archon Vrik from a single withered hand. Provided... This process is enacted within a day or so of the warrior's demise, and his will is strong enough that some of his spirit still resonates within his remains. His animus will slowly regenerate along with his physical form. Hence cabals upon real space raids take great pains to strike hard and fast, returning before the night is out with the remains of the deceased in order that their strongest warriors, barring the occasional ever so fortunate accident, can return to life. The key to this terrible process, of course, is pain. The Dark Eldar are rejuvenated by witnessing agony, and if saturated with enough of it, they can heal the most grievous of wounds. As such, the mortal remains of those delivered to the dubious care of the homunculi are installed into crystal-fronted pods, arrayed above the pain racks and torture tables. These sarcophagi are arrayed in concentric circles that rise up into the darkness, each holding a semi-cocoon Dark Eldar warrior in some form of regenerative state. The patients literally drink in the dark energies of the torturer's craft as the homunculi works upon his victim below. Ably assisted by his wreck servants and the semi-sentient engines of pain, As a cacophony of shrieks rises and falls around the chamber, those installed in the cocoons above slowly feast upon the resonant energies, ever so gradually growing back their bodies, skeleton first, then muscle and sinew, then alabaster skin until they are whole once more. During times of war, it is common for every one of an obliate regeneration pods to be filled with leering, red raw fiends that shiver and rattle with every fresh scream. A Realm Unbound And yet, these are but a fraction of the surreal sights and landscapes scattered throughout Dread Camorra. Across the Rift of Dead Hope, pillars of bone reach up to form a makeshift bridge into the Pale Fortress, In the City of Titans, enormous statues enact historic assassinations and coups with terrible inevitability. Vitreous heap is filled to capacity with piles of glassened body parts sorted into a landscape of limbs, torsos and heads. And in the bleak wilds of Iron Thorn, the choking gut clouds of the Red Smog bring the corpses of the cursed back to life. Cyclopean gates of crackling jade fire link one realm to another, guarded by the most vigilant of warriors, and in Devil's Orchard, noisome hanging gardens of grave lotus sprout from a mosaic of the dead. There is no end to the depths of the dark city, just as there is no end to the chilling depravity of its children. The Rise of Vect 
Kimura has grown from shadowed beginnings to a nightmare of galactic proportions. Its expansion is the manifestation of the vast intellect of Astrobal Vect, who rose from slavery to become overlord of the Dark City. Kimura in flames. Four thousand years after the fall, in the time that mankind calls M35, Kimura was to undergo its greatest ordeal. The slave Vect had risen through pure guile and murderous ambition to become the draken of what he called the Cabal of the Black Heart. When the elite forces of the Imperium mounted a full-scale invasion of Kimura, at the time, Vect, the hidden architect of this time of strife, was opposed at all turns by the most influential of the Dark City's noble houses, Zelan, Kralik, and Yithlian. By the time the invaders had been repelled, the power bases of these houses were in ruins, their archons slain. It was not long before Vect had replaced them as the true power in the Dark City. The seeds of the Imperial invasion were sown in the area known as the Desiderian Gulf. This region of wilderness space was well known amongst the starfarers of Segmentum Tempestus for the number of craft that had disappeared within its boundaries. The general practice was to avoid it at all costs. Unbeknownst to the Imperium, there existed a vast portal into a main arterial of the webway within Desiderian space, shielded by hollow fields that made it appear nothing more than a shimmer in the starlight. Behind this portal lurked the pirate fleets of Kimura, waiting for unweary prey like a trapdoor spider ready to pounce. The Dark Eldar noble houses preyed upon Imperial shipping lanes only rarely in order to escape retribution, and hence the missing ships were considered acceptable losses or else written off as a bureaucratic error. Vec's first move was to increase the frequency of these piratical raids tenfold. He made it his cabal's priority to capture every warship and invade every human world within reach of the portal. He tore apart the Imperial Guard regiments garrisoning the planets of the Desiderian system, devastated their fortifications and disappeared with his living bounty in the depths of the Dark City. Vect left nothing but ruin in his wake. This campaign saw the cabal of the Black Heart grow rich in plunder, and though Vect's detractors thought him a fool for antagonising the Imperial War Machine, the raids continued apace. With ponderous slowness, the Imperium reacted to the disappearances in the Desiderian Gulf. A strike cruiser belonging to the Salamanders chapter of the Adeptus Astartes was close enough to investigate, it was prowling the edges of the gulf in search of the sacred artifacts and relics of their Primarch. Captain Focus of the Salamanders ordered his ship deep into the Desiderian Gulf. After a short but extremely violent skirmish with Vex Cabalite fleet, Focus's craft, Forge Hammer, was crippled by haywire bombs and transported into the heart of the Dark City. The furor that resulted from this audacious capture set the spires of High Camorra aflame with intrigue. A captain of the Adeptus Astartes was a prize indeed, for such an individual could withstand extreme and prolonged torture before divulging his vital secrets. Before long, Vect found his fleet dwarfed by the armada of Archon Lord Zelan. The forge hammer, still rendered impotent by Vect's haywire field, was confiscated by Zelan taken to High Kimura and analysed for a long and exquisite dissection process. In his arrogance, Lord Zeeland had reckoned without the resourcefulness of the space marines trapped within. The ship's comm network was shorted out by the Haywag field, but unbeknownst to Zeeland, there remained a more pervasive method of communication available to the Astartes. Captain Focus's close companion, the gifted librarian Hestian, had sent a psychic request for aid as soon as the ship's systems had been disabled. Hestian was acting like a living beacon to the rest of his chapter, a beacon that was nestled deep within the spire-clustered confines of Zeeland's realm. When Lord Zeeland sent the elites of his warrior court to bring the space marines to his torture chambers, they were met with far sterner resistance than they had anticipated. The Dark Eldar found it relatively easy to carve through the hull of the strike cruiser and gain entrance to its dark and cluttered passageways, 
but overpowering the Space Marines proved nigh impossible. Lit only by the intermittent flashes of disciplined bolter gunfire, a vicious and desperate battle took place within the forge hammer until Astartes and Dark Eldar blood mingled together in its corridors. Zeeland was quick to realize that he had underestimated his quarry. Changing tack, he returned the salvage rights of the vessel to the Cabal of the Black Heart, ostensibly appearing generous, but in truth, intending to seize the Astartes once they had been taken captive. Vect readily agreed, forming small strike forces of all those warriors in his cabal that he suspected to be double agents and sending them into the lion's den piecemeal. Vect's cabalite warriors, victorious on a dozen worlds, ventured into the forge hammer without fear. The crippled ship echoed to the thump of explosions for days on end, and its stained glass viewports lit with the bursts of Promethean fire. The space marines were not giving up. Lord Zeeland was content to let Vex slowly drive his so-called cabal to destruction, thinking the Draken a fool for not attacking with all due force. Vex casually played a waiting game, systematically feeding elements of his cabal into the guns of the Space Marines in order to buy himself time, and even employing Camerite mercenaries with ties to Zeeland's court, none of whom emerged from the Forge Hammer alive. On the 16th day of the siege, the skies above High Kimura yawned wide. Somehow, the Salamander's chapter had received coordinates that had led them to their beleaguered battle brothers, and the Desiderian portal had mysteriously been left fully operational, its guards slain and its controls locked out so that they could not close. The fury of the Imperium thundered from the crackling jade webway portal directly above Archon Zealand's personal spire. Through it came ships bearing the heraldry of not only the Salamanders, but also the insignia of the Howling Griffins and the Silver Skulls. The spectacle of their vertical entrance was jewel-dropping, even for the jaded Camerites in the streets below. Two dozen strike cruisers, each a bullish chunk of Gothic architecture built for war, hammered through the wide-open portal into the skies of the Dark City. At their heart was the battle barge Vulcan's Wrath. An immense hulk of a ship, with broadside batteries that could flatten whole cities. Its prow was a vast jutting ram that ploughed straight through into the spire where Zeeland stood, crushing it like a hammer driven into a priceless sculpture of crystal and light. The battle in the sky. The Dark Eldar reacted swiftly. From nearby Port Shard came hundreds of exotic craft, each but a splinter next to the slab-like Imperial ships, but deadly nonetheless. Void Raven bombers and razor wing fighters careened out of their towering hangars like bats pouring from a cave, descending in a great flock upon each strike cruiser. Though many of them were blown out of the sky by the roaring broadsides, they systematically took out the Imperial ship's guns with focused void lance fire and sustained barrages from disintegrator cannons. The battle barge Vulcan's Wrath was caught by thick tentacles of electric force crackling out from Port Shard's salvage spars, rendering the majority of its weapon systems useless. One by one, the Imperial guns were silenced. But the Space Marines were tenacious foes. Ejecting from each of the strike cruisers came drop pods. Fired out at such velocity, they became weapons in their own right. So thick was the barrage of these meteoric transports that many smashed straight through the soaring Dark Eldar craft or ploughed into elegant star scrapers and smashed clean out the other side. The drop pods hurtled down, each bearing a squad of space marines into the depths of Kamora, where they deployed upon impact with guns blazing. They left ruin in their wake. Spires toppled and statues fell. War in the streets. The Salamander's counterattack had robbed the Dark Eldar of the initiative. Within minutes of the drop pod assault, the Space Marines had established a perimeter in the obsidian paved streets of the Kralik Quarter, and though they were taking heavy fire from the Cabalites and Scourges that soared through the skies above, their power armor was holding proof against the splinter weaponry of their foes. Even those Space Marines who took direct hits gritted their teeth and fought through the pain coursing through them. It was not long before the darkness began to gather in earnest. 
The denizens of the Dark City drawn to the conflict like sharks to blood. Through the boiling air came massed swarms of sky mounted hellions in reaver jet bikes, swooping down to rake and tear at the space marines. The jinking one-man craft proved too fast for Bolter Fire to intercept, so the salamanders instead sent up great roaring sheets of Promethean from their flamers. Whole gangs of hellions caught fire and wheeled away, shrieking in pain. From the gloom came the mandrakes, for the alleyways of Kimura have ever been their hunting grounds. The half-demon beasts clambered upwards from the space marine's own shadows to close their freezing fangs upon unprotected faces and slice throats with their silvered blades. Through the streets came raider transports full of Dark Eldar warriors, each squad leaping down into the ranks of the space marines, scattered throughout the district and laying about themselves with knife and splinter pistol. Battle was joined from one side of High Kimura to the other, and before long it devolved into a melee of terrifying proportions. The streets seethed with violence, but the space marines held their own. Entire sections of High Kimura burned as the invading space marines cut down or incinerated each new breed of horror that fell upon them. Word spread quickly of the invasion. High up in the arenas, the gladiators of the witch cults mobilized for war. The space marines within the city were now almost 500 strong, and they had established a perimeter throughout Kralik Quarter. High Archon Kralik himself had led a mass charge against the space marines, intending to crush the invaders that were tearing out the heart of his personal fiefdom. At first, he cut a path through the disciplined ranks of space marines, his force field surrounding him with flickering double gangers, so that it was impossible to tell his true location. The ancient Archon struck like a cobra, killing space marines with every thrust of his powered blade, until his rampage was halted by a stray blast from a dark lance that vaporised him where he stood. It was then that the witches of the Cult of Strife joined the fight. Hundreds of beautiful but deadly warriors leapt and spun through the ranks of the mustered space marines with dizzying speed. Heads began to roll as razor flails and impalers found their marks. Knives plunged deep into eye sockets and hydra gauntlets flashed red in the twilight. At their head fought Lilith Hesperex, grace and power incarnate. Warriors fell apart before her, chainswords fell from lifeless hands and bolt rounds hurtled through empty space where a blood-spattered she-devil stood a split second before. In the streets ahead, a patrician, Archon Lithian, of the silent scream saw a chance for further glory and joined the fight to prove his right to rule. The space marines fell back. They had lost half their number already and badly needed to regroup. Lilith and her attendants paused for barely a second before cutting down Ylithian and his warriors without mercy. Their part in Vex's grand plan played out. Lilith and her witches melted away into the mists. A Miraculous Reprieve As the forge hammer lay shackled with electric force high in the spires, the battle in the skies was intensifying. Zeeland's last command had been to destroy the captive ship, no matter the cost. Should mere humans recover his stolen prize, the Archon's authority and that of his noble-born peers would be shattered forever. Flights of winged scourges armed with haywire blasters and heat lances began to systematically disassemble the ship, and a fleet of ravager gunships met any who dared to counterattack with punishing fusillades that forced them back into cover. Then, in a storm of light, Terminators from the Salamander's First Company teleported directly onto the hull of the forge hammer and returned fire. The scourges were driven back and Captain Focus seized his moment. His men emerged from cover as one, sending a single crack missile soaring into each of the nine towering spars that held his craft captive with beams of electromagnetic force. Miraculously, each missile seemed to trigger a chain explosion and the burning spars crashed down into the streets below. 
Librarian Hestian summoned a storm of his own, a raging inferno in the shape of a flaming drake that tore the ravagers out of the sky, one by one. The Forgehammer had suffered terribly, but it was free from the Dark City's bonds once more. With a great shuddering roar, the strike cruiser began its ascent to freedom. Far below, the Space Marines fighting in Zeeland Quarter had become completely surrounded. Camera had come alive around them, and warriors from a dozen noble houses were converging upon their position. Nevertheless, the Forgehammer had torn itself free. A single curt comm signal was sent, and, within moments, the main bulk of the Space Marines battling in the Dark City teleported away in a blaze of light. Those that had been cut off from the main assault gave their lives to buy their brethren in time, or else were paralysed with hypertoxins and taken away to fight and die as warrior slaves. Confusion reigned as the haywire fields that had shackled the Imperial craft were disengaged one by one. The jet fighter squadrons of the High Archons moved to intercept, but were met by such an enormous volume of firepower from both friend and foe that they were forced to disengage. The battle barge Vulcan's Wrath, now joined by the critically wounded Forgehammer, fired retros and extricated itself from the burning ruins of what had once been Archon Zealand's pride and joy. The vast ship's engine blast flattened spires and star scrapers before the Space Marines made their escape. The Astartes fleet passed through the still yawning webway portal above Hykamora and escaped into real space. It was the aftermath of the Imperial invasion that changed Komora forever. The power vacuum left by the vanquished noble houses of High Komora was quickly filled by Astrobal Vect and his jubilant Cabal, who had proven their dominance over their rivals in the fires of war. The old order of Komora was in total flux, and nothing was certain. In the years that followed, Vect played the angles like a true master, forever asserting the meritocracy of the cabals over the aristocracy of the noble houses. So it was that the cabal of the Black Heart rose to ascendancy in place of the old nobility, and Archon Vect's stranglehold upon the fate of the Dark City began in earnest. The Panacea Wars as Vec's influence grew ever greater, the Archons of the newly formed Cabals sought audience in his court. Their petty schemes and veiled doublespeak bored him greatly. Even the famous beauty and barbed wit of the latest Archon to enter Vec's throne room, Lady Aurelia Malis, stirred him not at all. Eventually, Vec summoned all those who sought his favour to his throne room and set them an impossible task. The loss of a human world's population was of little import to the star-spanning empire of man. Humans bred like insects and were easily replaced. Vex's challenge was not to destroy a single world or star system, but to poison the entire Imperium and return with proof of the deed. Vec had set his challenge purely to thin the resources of those cabals who had wasted his precious time. He did not expect any of these so-called Archons to achieve the task set out before them, and if some of them met their demise in the attempt, then so much the better. As Vec's task was laid down, the Archon known as Lady Malice allowed herself a slight smile. Outwitting the lesser races was child play to her, and as large as the Imperium was, it was still only human. Gathering to her side the entirety of her cabal, the poison tongue, Malice mobilised her fleet and made haste into real space. Through her connections with the Harlequins of the Webway, she had knowledge of an Imperial Forge world that had suddenly become far more heavily defended than any of its neighbouring planets. The entire system had concentrated its military strength upon a single world, leaving the others lightly garrisoned and extremely vulnerable. The industrial planet of Verdigris 9 settled deep in the heart of Segmentum Obscurus, now literally bristled with defence batteries and interceptor cannon. Its hives were thronged to the point of claustrophobia with regiment after regiment of the Imperial Guard and the armies of the Adeptus Mechanicus and the God Machines of the Titan Legions loomed through the polluted air of the wastes around the hive's borders. Evidently, 
Something extremely valuable existed upon Verdigris, and Malice alone knew its nature. Her spies had informed her that archaeotechnologists had unearthed a rare and vital relic from when the Imperium was at its height, a standard template construct that could act as a blueprint for large-scale advancement across the galaxy. Every STC is of inestimable value to the Imperium of Man, but this particular construct, a medical miracle codenamed the Panacea, could save billions of human lives from death by poison and disease. The Baiting of the Beast A conventional assault was out of the question. The high fabricator of the planet had fortified his micro-complex to such an extent that he could fill the skies with burning metal in an instant, an inverse rain of bullets and blasts that would shred a Dark Eldar strike force in a matter of moments. Malice intended to retrieve the prize herself, but she could not do it alone. A blunt instrument was needed, and a big one at that. The fleet of the Poison Tongue entered real space through the Ophidian Gulf, emerging right on the tail of an immense orc fleet. The flutilla of ramshackle spacecraft stretched off in all directions, a roving scrapyard of gunned-up junk with a single vast space hulk at its heart. Malice commanded her captains to disable their night shields and fire at will. Her order was met with raised eyebrows at best, for the orc ships outnumbered them fifty to one, and many of the greenskin craft were already changing heading to an intercept course. Scowling, Malice led by example, personally manning her flagship's void cannon and blasting apart three orc ships one after the other. Chastened, her captains quickly took up the fight, dispatching squadrons of sleek fighters to make hit and run attacks on the largest orc ships. Anarchy reigned as the orc armada attempted to change course and intercept the fleet, harrying its rear like metallic sharks ripping at the flanks of a void whale. Suddenly, as one, the Dark Eldar fleet retreated at speed. The orcs, spoiling for a fight, mounted a hasty pursuit. The ensuing running battle lasted a dozen hours, the Dark Eldar ship staying tantalisingly out of reach, before Verdigris appeared on the Greenskin's fleet screens. Gathering a deadly momentum, the single-minded orcs pursued the Dark Eldar at speed, careening straight towards the High Fabricator's beloved macro-complex. Then, just as Verdigris' auto-defences illuminated the night sky with a myriad ruby stabs of laser fire, the Dark Eldar simply vanished. The orc ships ploughed into the world of Verdigris like a mailed fist into an unprotected face. Hundreds were reduced to ruin by defence laser fire, but such was their sheer bulk that on they came, megatons of burning wreckage slamming into the defence networks of the macro complex. The surviving orcs that had bullied through the high fabricator's firestorm hacked their way out of their burning craft and into the ranks of the defenders. In the dust wastes outside the hive, the Legio Titanicus mobilised to intercept the Greenskins, and the earth shook at their advance as they mercilessly hammered the orcs infesting the hive. Then, with terrible inevitability, the space hulk, foot of Gork, thundered out of the clouds. In a single earth-shaking instant, the god machines were crushed flat. Almost half of the macro complex was blasted apart in the explosion, its auto defences crippled and its surviving defenders hurled to the ground. The hammer and the knife. It was then that the skies wrenched open. Through a storm of jade light came the pirate fleet of Lady Malice, its deadly elegance the absolute antithesis of the brutal orcish armada. The Cabalites gunned down humans and orcs alike and fed upon their screams. Metal bear moths roared as orc battle wagons engaged the tank companies of the Imperial Guard and still more orc spacecraft smashed down into the city, the ground quaking with each new impact. As the buildings toppled around them, the Dark Eldar skimmers soared into the heart of the macro complex for Malace knew that her prize would be deep in the vaults. Packs of incubi plunged into the midst of the deafened, disorientated guardsmen milling in the breach, their tormentor fields sending out waves of black agony as their clave blades carved open human flesh. 
In the heart of the city, the dark feast was beginning in earnest. Malaise and her hand-picked elite slaughtered the guardsmen and Adeptus Mechanicus Scatari that guarded the palace of the High Fabricator. In their wake came hundreds of Cavalite warriors, meeting each Imperial Guard countercharge with punishing salvos of raw firepower. Lady Malaise stepped and twirled through the blood-mad brawl as if she were enjoying a pleasant walk instead of cutting her way through a war of her own design. She personally dismembered the armoured stormtroopers at the heart of the macro complex and commanded her warriors to break open the inner chamber within which the STC was hidden. But the chamber was already open, its door a smoking wreck. Oak bullet casings covered the floor, and within the vault, the high fabricator lay in a pool of his own blood, his legs sheared off at the knees. The prize was gone. Malaise flew into a red rage, killing several of her attendants, who she suspected of betraying her. Her plans lay in tatters. The macro complex, so efficiently plunged into total war, had now become irrelevant. Only the STC mattered. There was little chance of mustering the entire cabal whilst they were at feast. The complex had degenerated into chaos, and confusion abounded. Malaise gathered her court to her side, ordering her jet fighter squadrons to cease their punishment of the Imperial Guard and act as reconnaissance agents. In a matter of seconds, Malaise had news of a massive column of smoke-belching orc vehicles trundling out of the city and heading back towards the Space Hulk that had crash-landed out in the dust wastes. Lady Malaise summoned her personal transport and took off in pursuit. The story of the battle between Lady Malaise's airborne elite and the sprawling orc convoy has become infamous in the upper echelons of High Kimura. A frontal attack would have been suicidal, so Malay circled the gigantic orc convoy from a distance, picking off its outriders unit by unit. When the orcs moved to intercept, the Dark Eldar withdrew into the clouds, arrowing downwards once more to strike at a different location. Through the shattered skies, reavers jeweled with clumsy, smoke-belching orc flying machines and packs of scourges methodically sniped the storm boys that careened through the skies to intercept Malaise's force. Hour by grueling hour, the Dark Eldar strike force whittled down the hurtling flotilla of orc vehicles until a broken line of scrap metal and smouldering green corpses stretched all the way back to the outskirts of the macro complex. Malaise herself led the final assault, leaping down from her transport in a flurry of courtly robes onto the iron roof of the orc battle fortress at the head of the vastly diminished column. Her warriors followed suit, and though the orcs fought with true fury, the Dark Eldar were high on pain and moved like quicksilver. Before long, Malice had retrieved the lead-encased STC from the corpse of the big mech riding at the head of the orc armoured column. The Dark Eldar swiftly withdrew from the battlefield, leaving a raging war behind them. Upon her return to Kimura, Lady Melis did not return straight to Vex's throne room, but instead headed with her prize into her inner chambers. Her boot heels clacked smartly on the polished obsidian floor of her trophy halls as she strode back to her throne, pausing only to place the stolen STC upon a stasis pedestal between the mummified head of a human techno-savant and the gilded hands of Saint Carulia the Just. Word of her success spread fast, for the tongues of Kimura gossips are never still. That evening, Malise found herself the receipt of a personal invitation to dine with Vect at her convenience, for her unbridled success had impressed even him. So it was that Lady Aurelia and Malise became one of the supreme overlords in her circle. The War of Dark Revelations in the closing years of M41, Real Space found itself under attack from a new threat, the merciless and all-consuming high fleets of the Tyranids. It was not long before Vect had charged his minions and collaborators with a mission to gather intelligence. Hidden within the webway, Kimura had little to fear from such biological terrors, but if nothing else, Vex saw a useful tool in the Tyranid race. 
In contrast, the young and dynamic Empire of the Tau was absolutely terrified. The sophisticated armed forces of the Tau had barely repelled the ever-evolving High Fleet Gorgon and could ill afford another system-wide conflict. High Fleet Kraken had pushed its tendrils so far into the eastern fringe that the Tau Empire was virtually surrounded. The Tau sought to employ every mercenary, ally and confederate they could find in the war effort to hold back the unceasing tide of Tyranids and damn the consequences. When an alien lord calling himself Urian Rakarth contacted the Tau High Command via a grainy, static-laced vid capture, the Firecast were more than willing to parley. Rakarth offered to join the war against the Tyranids in return for what he called a cultural exchange, and despite his hideous appearance, the Tau officers eagerly accepted the deal. Certainly, Rakarth and his so-called homunculi seemed strange, but they had a lordly air about them and seemed to perceive the Tyranid invaders as a fairly minor threat. At first, the Tau High Command's decision to join forces with Rakarth's prophets of flesh seemed both timely and prudent. Upon the hyperverdant planet of Vigos, the conflict between the Tau and High Fleet Kraken raged fiercest of all. But wherever the Tau were at risk of being completely overrun by Tyranid wave attacks, blade-like craft would descend through the clouds. Dropping onto the lush battlefield, from each craft came clutches of sickle-handed, bare-chested warriors. They instantly strode into the swarming ranks of the Tyranids, shrugging off mortal wounds as if they were only a minor inconvenience, and delivering clinical decapitations in return. Where the scythe-limbed assault beasts of the Tyranid swarms penetrated the Tau lines, Dark Eldar attack craft would disgorge monstrous creations of corded muscle and sculpted bone. Raw-skinned and heaving with chemically-induced battle lust, the blank-helmed horrors plunged into the fray, their pallid homunculi masters drifting above them with macabre grace. To the Tau fire warriors, each new meat monster seemed like an evil effigy come to life, a mad artist's vision of a fleshy excess given form purely in order to kill. The fiendish creations fell upon the Tyranids with a dire energy, augmented limbs and metal gauntlets spasming, hacking and ripping until even the most ferocious Tyranid creatures had been reduced to a tangle of chitin and sticky black gore. There were a great many of Rakaf's masked minions were dismembered or gored, opened by large Tyranid beasts. They seemed totally impervious to pain. Even when missing limbs or set afire by bioplasma, the flesh creatures came on. The Tyranid assaults broke against them like waves against a cliff, and the Tau took full advantage of the reprieve. Where the elite of the chitinous Tyranid swarm stormed into the fray, Talos pain engines and Kronos parasite engines drifted in to wither away their life essences or pull them limb from limb. Where the Tyranid leader beasts strode towards the front lines, the homunculi themselves would employ strange and unknowable weapons, gauntlets that turned synapse beasts into dust, flickering ghost rays that drained the life force from the Tarvagon broodmothers, and hex rifles that turned serpentine tigons into gigantic glass statues. Though the homunculus's warriors were stomach-churning, they had turned the tide on dozens of fronts. The Tau High Command were mightily impressed, but also a little shocked at the cavalcade of hideous monsters employed by the homunculi. Yet the Tau already counted amongst their armed forces the cannibalistic Crutes and the insectoid Vespid, and the prophets of flesh were clearly from an advanced civilization. Just in case, High Command mobilized their reserves from the pristine world of Rubicon. The Tau upon Vigos breathed a collective sigh of relief. The Tyranid attack had been stalled, and reinforcements were on their way. The Path to Damnation Before long, the wizened face of Urin Rekarth appeared upon the screens of the Tau High Command once more. He spoke theatrically about the sadness in his heart at the loss of so many of his valued foot soldiers, and though there was no hint of sincerity in his words, none could deny that Rakoff's minions had borne the brunt of the Tyranid ground assault. In recompense, 
The homunculus requested 77 tau from each cast as part of the cultural exchange. A smile upon his ravaged lips, Rakoff requested there be accompanied by a delegation of seven ethrils. The ethereal cast is sacrosanct to the Tau, and that part of the deal was deemed unacceptable. However, the Tau were prepared to pay almost any other price for the greater good of their empire. High Command selected a delegation of dutiful volunteers from every caste, and a far above the planet of Vigos, a detachment of Mantha transports made their way into orbit towards a crackling sky portal that widened at their approach. Through this they passed into the unknown. Their fate was sealed. The next phase of the war against High Fleet Kraken was a focused counterattack. The Tau wished to reclaim polar continent from the Tyranids, and the Prophets of Flesh once more agreed to add their might to the offensive. Massed Tau hunter cadres flew through the snowstorms in perfect formation, teams of airborne battlesuits decimating the Tyranid hordes below. Winged Tyranids moved to intercept, hurtling through the blizzards to physically pull apart the Tau with tooth and claw. On the front lines, the homunculi unleashed their newest creations. Long-limbed grotesques moaned in despair as they hacked through the swarms. Flesh golems flailed and clawed with nests of clutching limbs. The firepower of the Tau battlesuits and the fury of their fleshy allies complemented each other perfectly, but still the Tyranids came on. The casualties on both sides were horrendous, but if anything, the homunculus seemed energised by the violence unfolding before them. The battle raged for six days, and ultimately, the Tau were victorious. In the post-battle debrief, however, a terrible suspicion began to dawn. Vid captures from Tau drones showed that their sinew-riddled allies were not pallid as before, but a blue-grey coloration all too familiar to the Tau. The Price Mere seconds after the Tau realised what had become of their cultural exchange, Rakaf's face appeared on every vid screen upon the planet of Vigos. He demanded that either the Tau handed over the Ephrals or 7,077 other Tau in their place. His request was met with outrage. High Command would see Rakarth punish for his crimes if it took their lives to achieve it. The Tau Reserve scrambled in response and made its way to intercept the homunculi craft in orbit. They found nothing but mirages and empty space. Suddenly, a desperate message from Commander O'Sheev blurted onto their screens. Rubicon, the planet the Tau Reserves had left behind, was under attack from thousands of skycraft. Its garrison cadres were suffering heavy losses against a foe stranger than even the Tyranids. They needed help, and fast. High Command was caught in a deadly trap. Somehow, the homunculi had moved with impossible speed, and they had invited their allies to the feast. Amongst those who had joined the invasion upon the lightly defended planet of Rubicon was Abstrabol Vect himself. As a reward for delivering the jeweled heart of the Tau star system right into his hands, Vect gave Urion Racketh and his prophets of flesh the privilege of leading the assault. The homunculus and his coven of morbid fiends did not disappoint. The battle upon Vigos was but a skirmish compared to the punishment visited upon Rubicon. The prophets of flesh led a mass charge of the monstrous and insane. Seen from above, the lands appeared to writhe with pallid bodies like a bed of maggots. At first, Tau garrison cadres put up a spirited resistance. Massed pulse rifle fire cut through the invaders until the battlefield smelt of burning meat. Thousands of wrecks, grotesques and pain engines fell to crisis battlesuit attacks and hammerhead tank columns. And yet, on the invaders came, crawling and flailing in their death rows to kill the fire warriors by the dozen. The Tau resolve began to waver. How could they drive back that which did not accept death? Worse still, the Tau had reckoned without the military genius of Vect. The initial homunculi attack was intended not to bring victory, only pain. When the cabals of the Dark Eldar attacked, the planet was already a vision of hell. The Tau were fighting for their lives against unholy and blasphemous monsters, many of whom had once been their comrades in arms. 
Vex Cabalites feasted well, each energised and invigorated to such an extent that even a single Dark Eldar warrior proved a match for an entire unit of fire warriors. The war raged on, but the Tau were hopelessly outmatched. When the sparse reinforcements that the High Command could spare reached Rubicon, they were confronted with a world of ruin. The tower battle complexes were breached and burning. The cadavers of thousands of crude and vespid auxiliaries arranged into macabre sigils of destruction that could only be seen from space. Of the tower, there was no sign. Every last one of them had vanished. The entire planet was barren, its populace stolen away into the darkness to feed the eternal hunger of Kamura. And with that final example of recent engagements the Dark Eldar have undertaken, I believe we can safely say that they are a degenerate species that needs to be annihilated wherever encountered. Many of our colleagues within the Ordos are concerned about future Imperial policy regarding the Eldar race, particularly with the involvement of this species in the resurrection of our most glorious regent, Primarch Rubute Gilliman. Rumour has it that there is now a concerted attempt by those followers of the apparently newly born God of the Dead to reunite the various strands of the Eldar race together into one coherent whole. This cannot be allowed, and would represent one of the greatest threats to humanity's continued dominance of the galaxy. Despite the birth of the Red Scar, we are the predominant power in the universe, and will continue to be once we have pushed the hordes of chaos back. To simply allow ourselves to be destroyed by a resurgent Eldar civilization is unacceptable. And here we can see what future would lie in wait for us with this degenerate Xenos breed, a powerful force once more. So I hope that this information is put to good use when discussion of the Xenos is had within the hallowed halls of the Imperial Palace. As ever, I am your loyal servant in all things. Inquisitor. Censored. Thanks very much, everybody. This turned into a far bigger video than I thought it was going to be. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody supporting the channel. You can see your names listed here. Thank you all very much. It means a lot that so many of you are supporting the channel. It's great. Please do remember to give the video a like, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and hit the bell if you are subscribed so you stay up to date with things I do on the channel. And also, if you'd like to share this with anyone you think would enjoy it, I'd really appreciate that. It gets new people to see my stuff on here, which helps everything, really. Okay, thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Cheers.